It's Easter Sunday. My goodness gracious. And, uh, you know, I've got a larger audience than I even thought. Last year, we had over 2,100 people physically on Easter weekend in the building. And I'll guarantee you there's more than that that's watching right now. I'm excited about what God's doing. And we're launching a brand new series right now entitled Hope is Here. So welcome today. We are celebrating today what no other religion in the world can boast about. No other religion in the world can celebrate this. It's the most important event in all of Christendom. It is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus began to tell them some things, and he said, the Son of Man is going to suffer many things, terrible things. He'll be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, the teachers of the law. He'll be killed, but in three days, he'll rise again. Last night, Kelly and I purposely went searching on Netflix and Prime and various uh, movie outlets till we found the passion of the Christ. And we sat in our den last night and watched it together, cried together, wept together. Uh, But because of what he did, we have hope today. In John chapter 2, Jesus answered them and said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Let me tell you, the the first of these messages, the first in the series of Hope is Here, is this message that Jesus keeps his word. I want you to understand that if he's given you a promise, whether it's in the Bible or whether he spoke it in your ears, he keeps his word. In fact, in Matthew 12 and 39, Jesus replied, he said, it's only an evil and an adulterous generation that demand a miraculous sign. He said, but there's no sign going to be given them except the sign of the prophet Jonah, who was in the belly of a great fish for three days. And watch this. Even so, the son of man, that was Jesus, he was talking about himself, must be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. In Matthew 21, Jesus asked them, he said, did you ever read the scriptures where it says the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone? You see, he said he would rise again on the third day and he did. Jesus keeps his word. So no matter what the circumstance, I want to tell you, he's alive today and, and, and he keeps his promise. And because he keeps his promise, no matter where we are, no matter what level we find ourselves in spiritually, he is able to reach down and touch us. The events of Friday was horrid. It was a torturous scourging. It was a beating beyond anything I have ever seen in my life. It was horrendous as his mother looked on and some of the disciples, John especially, and others, you know, slipped away and got away. But as the crowd jeered and cheered and sneered and Jesus was being beaten to a pulp in front of them, The torturous events on Friday now are done and over. He's not hurting anymore. He's not bleeding anymore. His bruises are gone. His wounds are healed. Salvation has been paid for. Uh, He is now forevermore seated at the right hand of majesty. His father, he has completed the mission for which he was born and the reason for which he came. And all we have to do today, wherever we are in this world, is to accept what he did on Good Friday many years ago. And if we accept what he did on Good Friday, and I will tell you, he did an amazing thing. He did more than I could ever do. He went all the way to, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit and became that supreme sacrifice for you and I. You so you, you, I want to tell you, you got to understand this, that Jesus is alive. 
He did what he said he would do. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He, the, the temple that was destroyed, it was his own. It wasn't the one that was 46 years in the building. They misunderstood him as do we so many times. But he raised his temple up again. He, he, he has the keys of death and hell. He's a promise keeper. And so hope is here today because of that. You see, now let me talk about hope. Hope is commonly used uh, to mean a wish. Its strength is the person who wishes desire. However how bad they desire it, that's the strength of the hope. But the Bible hope is a little different. The Bible hope is a confident expectation of what God has promised and its strength is not in desire, but its strength is in his faithfulness. And you see, one can have hope without faith. When people have hope, they, they or excuse me, one cannot have hope. You cannot have a hope without faith. Let me show you. You see, when people have hope, they have faith because they hold a belief that says, I believe the future is going to be better. While they have no evidence or, or, or no grounds to prove that the future is going to be better, but they say, I have a hope and faith. It's the substance of what I hope for and the evidence of what I don't yet see. So while faith without hope is possible, hope without faith is not. You cannot have hope if you don't have faith. I just finished a series entitled Daring Faith, and there's about nine messages that I preached in that Daring Faith series, and I'm telling you, without faith, Hebrews 11 and 6 says, it is impossible to please God. You must come to God, believe that he is God, and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Easter points us to the the, you know, the tragedy, uh, ra rather, uh, Easter points us beyond the torture, beyond the tragedy of Friday, beyond the events of Good Friday to the hope of Sunday and the empty tomb. There's a antonym, or, and there's actually several. What is the opposite of hope? You see, if you're watching me today and you don't have this hope that I talk about, then let me define your life. Let me describe what it is like. It's filled with doubt. It's filled with disbelief. It's filled with discontentment. It's filled with discouragement. It's filled with disparity even pessimism, and a life of hopelessness. But I tell you, you don't have to have all of that when hope is here. He is here. We don't have to disbelieve and be discontent. We can accept him by faith on who he is based on the record of what he's done. And I tell you, if he raised himself from the dead, if he went into the grave and the corridors of hell and came back victorious, there's absolutely nothing that he can't do. There's nowhere that he can't go to reach you. I want to, if I may, give you the key verse for the entire series, and I, I need to kind of unpack it. So in, in 1 Peter 1 and 3, the English Standard Version says it like this. I, I just want you to see it. Blessed be God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. A living hope. I, I like that. I don't want a dead hope. You see, a dead hope would be, you know, uh, someone who's died and there's no hope for him. The Apostle Paul said, if in this life only I have hope, I am of all men most miserable. But, but we have hope beyond this life. We have hope beyond the grave. He said a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Did you catch that? Our hope is founded in what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. The resurrection from the dead. Watch this. He said because of that, 
He says, uh, we have an inheritance that is, what's this? Imperishable. It cannot go bad like canned goods or light bread. It is undefiled. It cannot be messed up like you and me. It is unfair. Fading. It's not like, I mean, the best paint job eventually exposed to enough UV rays, it will fade. But Jesus said we have a hope in him that is unperishable. It is undefiled. It is unfading. Why? It is kept for you in heaven, guarded by the power of God Almighty. We have a hope. <laughs> Christ in you, the writer said, the hope of glory. So what's this? Watch this. You got to catch this because everything is predicated upon this. Don't miss this. He said, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials that have tested the genuineness of your faith. I would say COVID-19 has been a pretty good test. He said, but, but right now you've got some various trials that are going on. He said, but these trials are more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested in the fire, that you may be found in the result of praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter said, we have this living hope. We have this inheritance that is imperishable, that is undefiled, unfading, and kept for us. You see, now there are those who I need to talk to today that I think you've lost hope. There are those who have, you don't seem to have any hope. You've lost hope. And then Paul told us a story in the book of Acts chapter 27. And I want to share this story with you. He is uh, on his way to the emperor Nero to stand trial before Caesar. Uh, and he's sailing on a vessel and he tried to get them to wait because the, the, it didn't look like it was going to be a good time to sail. But in Acts chapter 27, you can read the whole chapter, but right now let me just paraphrase it. He said, men, I believe there's going to be some trouble ahead. This is verse 10 of 27. He said, I believe there will be shipwreck wreck and loss of cargo and even the danger. We could imperil our own lives. But the Bible says the officer chose to believe the owner of the boat more than he did the apostle. And the next day, verse 18 said, <coughs> gale force winds continued to batter the ship. The crew began throwing out cargo. The following day, the event took some of the ship's gear. They began to, they began to throw the gear overboard. A terrible storm was raging upon them for many days, and, and it blotted out the sun and the stars until, watch this, here it is, until at last all hope was gone. And that's where some of you are at right now. All hope is gone. There, there, there's no more hope. It, it's over. In your mind, it's done. And that's what had happened to them. But the apostle said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. He says, uh, you would have avoided this damage and this loss. And uh, he said, but take courage. Here's what I want to tell you. Those of you right now who feel like it is lost and there is no hope left, I want to tell you to take courage. The apostle said, last night, the angel of God to whom I belong came and he stood by me. He says, the angel of God stood by me and he said, do not be afraid, Paul. He said, because you are going to stand before Caesar. I want you to know, there is hope when it all looks hopeless. There's still hope beyond what your physical eyes can see. There's hope beyond what you're hearing on the news. There is hope beyond what you're feeling in your heart right now. Hope is here and his name is Jesus. So let me, let me tell you how bad, I mean it goes from bad to worse. Paul has told them that hope is coming. I've told you that hope is here. But he says, about midnight on the 14th night of the storm, they were being driven across the Adriatic Sea. 
Sailors sensed that they were close to the land. And when they sensed that, they'd done a sounding and found out they were about 120 feet deep. A little while later, they found out they were about 90 feet deep. And they were scared they were going to run aground and hit the rocks and break up. So they dropped four anchors out the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. Could you imagine? You're in the middle of a storm. You got to catch this. They hadn't seen the sun for 14 days. They hadn't seen a star in 14 days. They hadn't eaten a bite of food in 14 days. And all hope that we should be saved is now gone. They feel like they're coming upon land somewhere, so they drop large anchors out the back, hoping to drag because the wind is pushing them aground. And they're scared they're going to bust up, and it looks like all hope is gone. And so they're hoping to drag and slow themselves down. Notice what happens. He says the sailors tried to abandon the ship. They lowered the lifeboat. They put out anchors. Uh, you know, and Paul says, listen, they wanted to abandon the ship. And Paul said, listen, he said, you have got to stay in the boat. You have to stay aboard. I want to tell you something. A correlation for today. In order to survive, you've got to stay on board. In this tragedy we find ourselves in right now, it is not time to abandon the church or abandon God or abandon your spouse or your children. No, you got to stay in the boat. We're going to get through it. There is hope. Hope is here. God had already sent an angel and told Paul it's going to be all right. He's just trying to convince everybody else. Like I'm trying to convince you right now. Hope is here. He says, uh, if you... If you don't stay in the boat, you can't make it. So the soldiers cut the ropes and let the lifeboat float away. And just as the day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. He said, you've been worried. You haven't touched food for two weeks. Please eat something now. Watch this. Here it is. Here's a promise. For not a hair of your head will perish. Let me say this. It's going to get rocky in here. He said, it's, a matter of fact, he said, we are going to shipwreck and the boat's going to come apart. He said, but you got to hold on to what you got. I'm telling you, we're at the end of the rope, but we're tying a knot and hanging on. Hope has been promised to us. Hope is here. His name is Jesus and he's going to get us through it. And we know it because he got himself through the grave, through hell. And he come back and he sits at the right hand of the father. Well, in a nutshell, he keeps his word. Jesus is a promise keeper. If he has said it, you can take it to the bank. Let every man be a liar. But God is truth. And in him is no shadow or turning. So when the morning dawned, they didn't even recognize the coastline. They saw the bay, if you will. They cut the anchors and let them fall into the sea. But the Bible says at the end of that story... Everyone escaped safely to the shore. Hope showed up right in the middle of calamity, right in the middle of disaster. You see, I said that for those who feel hopeless, for those who think they have no hope. You do indeed have hope. But they're not the only ones. There was others. After the crucifixion, there were those uh, closest, the disciples were the closest men to Jesus, the very closest ones to him, and many of them lost hope. Many of them lost hope completely. Let me show you. Judas had betrayed him. He went out and hung himself. Peter had denied him. He went out and wept bitterly. And decided to re return to his previous job of fishing. It wasn't just him, but several others. Thomas and Nathaniel and uh, various others went with him. James and so on. You see, and, and so they went back. You know, it was a good thing. Three years, it lasted. But now he's gone. <laughs> now he's gone and what do I do? How am I going to make it? And so they decided to go back to what they knew. They knew how to fish. And so on the Sea of Galilee, there they are again, fishing. 
And they look up one morning and someone calls out to them and said, have you any meat? All of a sudden they realized that it was the Lord. Well, it took a little bit more than that. He said, you know, cast your you know, net over here. And they did. And they took in this great draught of fish. And someone said, it's the Lord. And Peter jumped into the water because he wasn't dressed properly. And, um, but, but, but they made their way to the land and they got there. And Jesus already had some fish. He already baked some on some coals. And he, uh, he serves them. And for the second time in Peter's life, on the same sea, Jesus looked at him and said, follow me. I hadn't forgot about you. I told you at supper the other night that the shepherd would be smitten, the sheep would be scattered. I told you, Peter, that you would be offended of me, and you said, not so. Even if I should go to prison or even die with you, I will in no wise deny you. And the same night you did three times. I told you you would. And I also said, when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. And now you've been converted. You see, he said, I kept my word. I told you I was coming back for you. And I told you, you know what he told the disciples earlier that day? Those who found him early Sunday morning when the tomb was open, they went looking for him. He said, go tell my disciples and Peter that I am alive, that I have risen from the dead, and I've gone before him into Jerusalem. I'm telling you, he's a man of his word. God does not forget. Jesus does not promise and then take it back. No, no. He keeps his word. And hope has shown up on the Sea of Galilee. And he looked at Simon Peter and he said, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know I love you. He said, feed my sheep. He said it one more time, Simon Son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? More than what? More than fishing. I called you to be a fisher of men, not a fisher of fish. Do you love me more than these? He said, you know I love you. Feed my lambs, the Lord said. He looks at him again the third time, and some people speculate, and I don't know if Jesus asked him this three times because he had denied him three times, but it stands, you know, it's plausible. He looked at him and said for the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said, yea, Lord, thou knowest all things. You know I love you. He said, well, then feed my sheep. And then he went on to tell him when you were young, you would gird yourself and put on your clothes and walk where you wanted to walk. But there's coming a time when you're going to be old and others will bind you and take you where you don't want to go. Here's what I want you to know, though. Because of what Jesus had done, because of Calvary, and because of him coming back the second time, and and the hope that Peter uh, had, the hope that he had seen come alive, I'm going to tell you all the way to the day he died. It was the apostle Peter that stood up on the day of Pentecost and said, Ye men of Galilee, these men are not drunk as you suppose, seeing that it's only the third hours of the day. But this is, what the pro- this is what the prophet Joel said. Then in the last days, says God, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your daughters, are, you know, they're going to uh, dream dreams and your sons and see visions and all of this. And he says, this is that. And it wasn't done in the corner. Everybody saw it. Peter became the premier preacher on the day of Pentecost. And when he died, he said, They would crucify him. He said, turn me upside down because I'm not even worthy to die the way my Lord died. I'm telling you, we have hope beyond measure. Lord, let me tie this up. So I I want you to understand that, that, that hope is here. There are those who say, I have no hope, but you do. Paul thought they had no hope, or the people thought they had no hope on the way to Rome. Peter, James, and, and Thomas, and uh, these guys going back fishing, and they thought there was no hope. Matter of fact, Thomas said, unless I see him with my eyes and touch the nail prints in his hand and touch the scar in his side, I will not believe. Jesus showed up again. Thomas was not there the first time, but he was the second time. Jesus came right through the walls being with the doors closed, and he looked at Thomas and said, handle me and see If it's not I, Thomas fell down on his knees and grabbing him by his hand said, my Lord 
And my God, you know what he just now found? Hope, hope for living. Hope was there. Wow. So I want you to know Isaiah said in chapter 41, fear thou not. I am here with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I'll strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with my right hand of righteousness. Hope is here. And because of him, please understand, I have hope in the darkness. Because of him, I have hope in the darkness when I cannot see and when I cannot hear. Because of him, I have hope in my dilemma when I don't know what to do. Because of him, I have hope in the day of discouragement, for he is the lifter of my head. Because of him, I have hope in the midst of disaster, because he's the only one that can help me and rebuild me. Because of him, I even have hope in my death, because he's already been there and come back and has the keys of death and hell. The grave couldn't keep him. Death couldn't hold him. So grave, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? No, no, no. Moral, put on immortality. And corruption, put on incorruption. Amen. Death has been swallowed up in victory. He's alive. We have hope today. Hope is here. I have hope in calamity. I have hope in the midst of horror. I have hope. Why? Because he'll hide me in the cleft of the rock. He'll hold me in the hollow of his hand. In the day of trouble, he'll hide me in his shelter. He'll conceal me under his mighty wings and under his tent. He'll hide me. I have this hope that'll never fade away. I have a hope that'll never leave me, though friends leave me. You see, Jesus said, it was not an enemy that reproached me, but it was a man, thou mine own equal, who walked to the house of God with me, took counsel with me. He lifted up his heel against me. But I am telling you, though friends leave you, though acquaintances leave you, Jesus said, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Never. So, thank God for his pavilion. Thank God for the rock that is higher than I. Thank God for the banner that is over me. Thank God because of Jehovah Shammah, he is there. I don't care where you are. You say, I'm in the gutter. He'll be there. All you got to do is cry. Let, let me show you. I'll close with this. David, the great man of God, the great king of Israel, he reached a time in his administration when his son, Absalom, rose up against him and tried to commit a coup, tried to overthrow his dad. Matter of fact, Absalom slept with one of David's wives, and it was a horrible, horrible situation. He subverted the people. He sat in the gate and said, if I was your king, you know, I would do better than what daddy's doing. If I was your king, I would do this and I would do that. And this was in its heyday. David said, but in my distress, I cried to the Lord. I prayed to my God for help. And he heard me from his sanctuary. It reached his ears. And I want you to know wherever you are right now, that when you cry to God, I don't care where you are. You might be at the liquor store right now in the parking lot with the fifth in your right hand. Call out to him and he will hear your cry. You may be so high you can't hardly understand a word I'm saying. Call out to him and he'll sober you up right now. You might be with the other person that's not your spouse right now and just happen to tune in. I'm telling you, wherever you are, call out to him and hope is here. Let me go on. David said, he heard my cry. It reached his ears. Verse seven said, he, I, I want you to get this because this is the links that God will go to. He said, the earth quaked and trembled. 
The foundations of the mountain shook. They quaked because of his anger. He said, smoke poured from his nostrils. Fierce flames leaped from his mouth. Glowing coals blazed from him. Catch this, verse 9. He opened the heavens and came down. <laughs> when a father hears his child crying, there ain't nothing going to stop him from going. He opened the heavens and came down. Dark storm clouds were beneath his feet. Mounted on a mighty angelic being, he flew, soaring on the wings of the wind. He has heard his child cry, so he's coming down. He shrouded himself in darkness, veiling his approach with dark rain clouds. The clouds shielded his brightness. You know why? It killed everybody. The clouds shielded his brightness. He said, and verse 13, the Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded in hailstones and burning coals. He shot forth his arrows and scattered the enemies. His lightning flashed and they were greatly confused. That's what he'll do to your enemies right now. Then at your command, O Lord, at the blast of your breath, the bottom of the sea could not be seen. This is what God, God will go to the depths of the sea for his child. You see, he says, and the foundations of the earth are laid bare. Verse 16 says, he reached down for me. From heaven, he reached down from heaven and he rescued me from my powerful enemies. Some of you got some powerful enemies. Some of them are real enemies. Some of them are addictions. Some of them are, are thoughts in your head. But he rescued me from these powerful enemies, from those who hated me and those who were too strong for me. They attacked me at the moment when I was in distress. But the Lord supported me. He led me to the place of safety. He rescued me because, watch this, because he delights in me. Let me tell you something, friend, wherever you are, you are the apple of God's eye. If there had only been one man or woman on this earth, Jesus would have still died for you. That's how much he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. My goodness gracious. So let me, let me say this. There's hope today. Hope is here because he's alive. Wherever you are right now, do you need him? Do you need him to come to you? Do you need him to come where you are? Call out to him right now where you are and he will come down. I'm telling you, he'll roll back the clouds of heaven and step out and come down. He sent an angel for Daniel. He sent an angel for Paul, for John. He came himself. For Samuel, he came himself. I'm telling you, if you just call out to him, he'll come down. Whew! I feel his mighty power here right now. I want to pray for you right where you are. Let me say this. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you might be listening to me right now from wherever you are. I certainly want to know. I, I want you to let me know where you're listening from. But most importantly, if you pray this prayer of salvation with me, if you ask Jesus to come into your heart, I need you to let us know. Here's the prayer. Jesus, I needed hope. And you are that hope. Hope has a name and his name is Jesus. And I heard your servant preach it today. And I want this hope in my heart, not just in my head, but I want it in my heart. The same hope that came forth on the third day. The same hope that brought, brought help and hope to Paul, to Daniel, to Moses, all these other guys. The one that brought hope after denial. Hope after betrayal. On and on it goes. I want you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Please forgive me of my sins. I'm not worthy and I know it. There ain't nothing I can do to deserve it. 
But I lay myself on your altar right here and right now. Maybe you're in your car. Just pull over and just bury your face in your hands. And Lord, I just lay myself before you now. Maybe beside your couch, Lord, I just kneel, just slip right around onto your knees and I just kneel before you now, oh God. You are the hope of the world. And I want you in my heart. And I'm telling you, if you ask him to come, he has heard your prayer right now. And I'll guarantee you that warm feeling that overtakes you right now, I don't know, some have said it feels like goosebumps. It feels like electricity. Whatever it is, the Spirit of God doing a work inside you right now. Let him have his way. You're a brand new person. You have a new name. Why? There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. He has inscribed your name in the Lamb's Book of Life on this Easter 2020. Hope is here. Hallelujah. Lord, I bless you and I thank you. I praise you for the great hope. I praise you for the great hope that you've given me. Now listen, my friends, because, because of that hope and because of what Jesus has done, we have the opportunity now to partake in communion. The opportunity to partake in the Lord's Supper. This commemorates the Passover, the bread represents the body of the Lord. The blood, the wine represents the blood of the Lord. You remember way back when they, they come out of Egypt, they would do the Passover feast. And you remember they would take blood and they'd dip a branch of, um, uh, they would dip a branch down into the blood of a sacrifice they'd killed and they would sprinkle upon the doorpost and the lintel. And the death angel would come by and he said, but when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. That's where we get the word Passover. And when the blood is applied to your life, your heart, that blood that you accepted this morning, the blood of Jesus Christ, he says, you no longer have to die when the blood of Christ. You see, I mean, we all die a physical death, that first death. He said, but the second death, which is being cast into hell, he said, it has no power over you because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he held it up and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. So wherever you are right now, I want you to just take the bread. You say, well, I couldn't get the unleavened bread. It's okay, just get a piece of light bread, get a saltine cracker, it doesn't matter, get a cheese, it, whatever it is. Get something that's symbolic only, there's no power in the, the, the bread itself that we're using, it's, it's symbolic. But get it and hold it up. This is your body, Lord. And I take the body. I believe in the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You may take the bread. Thank you, Lord, for your body. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your body that was broken for me. Thank you, Lord, for taking that beating. And we're looking back at Calvary. We're looking forward to the day of redemption. We're looking forward to that day when you come again in the clouds of glory. And that night, after he took the bread, he took the cup. You say, man, that's a big old cup. We had the little communion cup, but I told Josh, I don't want, I want to do it just like you're doing it at home. I didn't actually have the little unleavened bread. I had a little piece of a honey bun. That's just what it was. He poured me some grape juice in this mason jar. But Jesus said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. When you take this cup, I want you to know he didn't just sign his name on some document. He shed his blood. You may take the cup.
Thank you, Lord, for your body. Thank you for your blood. I'm so moved on this Easter. It's so different than what I thought, God. I never dreamed I'd preach to an empty church house. The church is full. The church is full all over the place right now. God, they're watching from their cars, from their living room, from a boat. They're watching somewhere, Lord. It just wasn't the way I thought it was going to be, but it's all right. Because there's many right now that have trusted in the hope of the world. There's many right now, God, that have put their trust in you because I said hope is here and they feel it right now on this Easter day. It ain't what I had in mind, God. But I want to say just like your son Jesus said, nevertheless, not as I will. It ain't got to be the way I want it, God, as long as it's the way you want it. As long as you have your way. Touch your people today wherever they are. Listen, if you prayed with me today, I'd love to hear about it. Just just go to harborwc.com forward slash connect. Please let me know that you were a first time, second time, or third time guest. If you'll let us know, we'll get you a gift out in the mail because we believe in doing life together with you. We want to welcome you to the house of God. If you need prayer, Go to harborwc.com forward slash prayer. There's a prayer request form. If you want to know what to do next, just go to harborwc.com forward slash next steps. And we've got some next steps for you. And last but not least, if you say, Pastor, I want to be a part of what you're doing. And let, let me tell you something. There's people that have come by the church and just dropped off. So, no name, just dropped off couple of hundred dollars, some dropped sixty dollars, some mailed this, some mailed that. People from whoever and wherever, I don't even know some of them. They say, I want to be a part of what the harbor's doing. If you want to do that, you can do it by going to harborwc.com forward slash give anywhere in the world. You can make a difference in this church, in this community, and literally around the world. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining the harbor on Easter Sunday. Resurrection Day 2020. God bless you is my prayer. We love you and we can't wait to see you again. What an amazing message Pastor just delivered to us all. While this may not be the usual way you join with us for worship on Easter, it's what we're doing right now. And while many in our nation and around the world are struggling with the pandemic, we believe we serve a mighty and powerful God who is not limited by what seems to be impossible. We're believing for somewhat of our normal lives back again. So thank you so much for joining us live. And this is our sweet pastor's wife, Kelly Sains, and she's gonna tell you how you can take your next steps in your walk with the Lord. Absolutely, and I'm so ready to see you guys again in person. You know, church has been our lives for the past 33 years, and we're so ready to see you guys again. It just don't seem normal, it don't seem right. Mm -hmm. But if you dedicated your life to Jesus today, we would love to hear from you. You've made one of the best decisions you'll ever make in your life. So if you want to go to harborwc.com forward slash next steps, we would love to hear from you. Also, while you're on that link, there you can fill out the connect card. You can sign up for baptisms, mm -hmm. life groups, and prayer. So we encourage you to take your next step today. And we love you guys, and we thank you so much for joining us this morning. And we look forward to seeing y'all next Sunday at 9 a.m. Bye.